Hi everyone, welcome to our fifth art history lesson and today we're going to be learning about my favourite subject of all, ceramics. Please enjoy! Alright, so today we are going to be looking at ceramics. Um, so we're going to be looking at a few different ceramics from around the world that I really like um, and just having a brief overview about clay. Um, so here we are, here's um, some, somebody working with some clay. Um, here's somebody working on a wheel. I think that's quite a hypnotic picture, I really like that. And that's quite, you can see the colour of that clay is quite different. Then here's the classic that most people think about when they start to think about pottery, um, The Infamous Ghost, which is a film I've never seen actually. And then um, here's how I would rather be doing Ghost. Um, I would much rather do it with a lovely French bulldog um, rather than Patrick Squeezy, who quite frankly scares me. All right, so now, now on to the real stuff. So this is clay. What is clay? Quite a lot of us have worked with clay. We do quite a bit of clay at the coach house. Um, and clay is a type of fine-grained natural soil material, vague, um, that contains certain miracle, miner, not miracles, minerals that develop plasticity when wet. So it's essentially something that we dig out of the ground that's got certain properties that mean it is pliable and plasticky when, when wet, so we can kind of move it around and shape it and it'll keep its shape and also dry to hard. And when we fire it, which is a word for heating it up to very, very hot, um, it becomes almost like stone. It becomes very, very solid and stops absorbing water. So clay's had a variety of uses over time. Um, kind of the first um, thing I think of is building. So Quite a lot of kind of early homes and some homes still today are used um, built using clay. Um, so you can make bricks from a kind of clay substance. And you can also just make kind of like hard houses. So for instance, cob houses are made using a kind of a mixture of clay, straw and something else. Um, and also tiles, um, which you've kind of, people would use on their houses or on their floors. Um, and also as a seal, because when clay... Um, is fired hard, it, is, it doesn't absorb any water, it can be quite useful for sealing things in but you don't want to leak. Um, so also obviously utensils, kind of pots and pans and all that jazz. Clay tablets were one of the earliest forms of things for writing on. So you'd have a kind of wet clay in a kind of a slate thing and you would write in that, kind of an early form of communication. Instruments as well, so you get kind of clay pipes, clay drums, clay little flutey things. Um, and then lastly, one that I've only just learned today, is this medicine. Um, you, some people kind of eat it to kind of soothe their stomach um, and also kind of to stop diarrhoea. Um, and parrots do that as well um, because clay is slightly alkaline, so it'll kind of neutralise um, the acid. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I think you're much better taking an antacid, um, just to be disclaimer there. All right, so clay is naturally occurring and can be dug from the ground, as we can see in this picture here. Um, you can go out and dig your own clay, wild clay, but it will need processing before you can use it for making ceramics. So you could dig clay out the ground and probably use it to build a structure, um, but you, it wouldn't necessarily react well in a kiln. Um, so you need to do some sort of, you need to kind of harden it up, then grind it down and then filter it to get out the impurities. Um, and then you'd need to kind of do an analysis on it to see what sort of clay you've got because Clay from different parts of the world will be different, um, it'll have different minerals in it and it will react differently to heat. Um, and so you can dig clay, which is what you'll get kind of here, some dug clay and you'll process it and you'll get the smooth clay. But other clays are now formulated in factories because people kind of know what sort of ingredients to keep put in to get the kind of clay they want, be that for pottery, be that for making sinks, be that for making tiles, you know, we can, if you've got different industrial uses for clay and for that you'll want a different type of clay. There we go. So there's a kind of example. You've got maybe the clay you would dig in your garden versus the clay that is produced in a factory. Um, so kind of these wild clays, as they're called, will be slightly more unpredictable. They might be slightly more rough. Um, they might have some more interesting colour in them. You just never really know what you're going to get. 
So there's lots of different types of clay that I'm not really going to go too much into now because we would be here forever. But um, so the clay that we mostly use at the coach house is this middle one, air than wear, because um, it's quite easy to work. It comes in a range of colours and you don't need to fire it too high so it doesn't use too much energy. Because, for example, stoneware, which is quite a popular clay for kind of potters to use, um, you do need to fire it to a much higher temperature um, and it kind of that's more expensive if you do it repeatedly and um, so stoneware clay is kind of it absorbs less water and it's a bit harder so you can put it outside if you put an earthenware pot outside over winter it's going to crack because it can't cope um, with kind of absorbing water and then freezing and then the other clay we're going to kind of touch on today is cowlin um, which is a kind of porcelain. So if you think of porcelain, it's very fine. Um, and porcelain, it's a very fine clay, but it's also very strong. Um, it fires to a much higher temperature. You can use kind of quite interesting glazes on it. Um, but the thing with porcelain is because it's so strong, it remembers the shape it's been in the past. So it's quite prone to warping in the kiln. And warping is the word for when you heat it up to a high temperature and it starts to move. Um, so it's kind of the strength has benefits but it also has kind of consequences as well. I'm not going to go too much into different types of clay because we can get really geeky about it and I don't think we want to do that today. So now we're going to have a look at kind of different methods for building. Um, so we're going to start looking at coil building which is kind of one of the earliest techniques and also one of the most straightforward. I love a bit of coil building. I did all coil building for my entire degree show at uni um, and I think it's quite a fast fun method so that's where you'll probably have done it at the coach house where we, we roll out sausages and then we layer them up we join them together and we smooth them out like this person is doing here they're building up their coils and you can create um, quite complicated forms depending on how fast you go and um, because remember we need to let the kind of the clay dry a little bit so it can support itself and then on the right here, we've got Korean potter Song Hee Won, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, um, who's building a huge Korean vessel called an Ongi, um, which is kind of a, a, rounded, a rounded vessel. But she's building an absolutely massive one. Um, it's one of the biggest ever made. So I, yeah, I just thought it'd be good to show that you can, yes, we do coiling at the coach house, we do little pots, but it can be scaled up to make some quite huge and complicated things. The second technique we're going to look at is slab building. So that's where you roll out sections of clay, let them dry a bit so they're a bit stronger, and then you score them. So you kind of make a little cross hatching mark and then wet to that. So you kind of you get kind of a, almost a clay glue, and then you can join them together. And um, so this person here on the left is making a box. So that's quite a nice straightforward thing to make when you're using slabs. Um, and slabs can get up to huge sizes, you can make very complicated things. It gets quite engineering -y when you're doing that sort of thing and you all need, need all sorts of different support so you need to make sure it's all drying at the right rate and it can get very complicated. Um, but here's a nice piece on our right by Betty Woodsman who we're going to look at a bit later in the day. Um, who This is called Pillow Vase. And this is something she's made using just slabs so you're not limited to kind of square things, you can make quite organic shapes. And she's decorated it in a very organic manner. Now, I really like her work, as you'll find out later. Yeah, so that's, that's slab building. Um, if anybody of you worked with Belinda, our lovely volunteer, she's very into slab building. Um, and she can make some really beautiful things with slabs. Um, I myself am not as technically minded. I find it very difficult. There we go, and then we've got throwing on a wheel. So there we go, we've got Patrick Swayze back again. Uh, but here's a, kind of a slightly better example of, or more successful example of throwing using a wheel. Okay, we've also got somebody here coiling up, lifting all the clay from the base, and then they're kind of bellying out. That's this technique where you kind of make it fatter from the inside, and then they're fixing the rim. There we go. So that's a very speeded up version of how you would form something on a wheel. Um, they're managing to use a lot of clay there, and that's really impressive because um, the thing about 
working on a wheel is you need to be able to center the amount of clay that you're working with. So you need to be able to kind of push it and compress it and bully it into being in the exact center of the wheel, um, which is, I'd say, the hardest bit. Um, so I personally don't have the strength. My, my little cheap pottery wheel can't cope with it, wouldn't be able to cope with that amount of clay. I thought that was quite a good wee gift to show you. There we go. So there's a, there's a still one. Um, that's somebody there, they're kind of lifting up their pot, they've made a little foot at the bottom and now they're working on the rim. There we go. So um, throwing on a wheel, it takes, takes a lot of hours um, to learn how to be kind of competent at it, but once you've got it, it's, it's a really, really fun technique. Um, and it's thought that the earliest forms of pottery wheels, which are called slow wheels, were probably developed around 4,500 BC. Um, which is a really long time ago. I'm not really sure entirely what that means, but a long, long time ago. Um, yep, so it's thought that they were developed from people kind of hand building their pots and maybe coiling and maybe having them on a leaf or something, kind of turning them as they go so they kind of can do more pottery with less work. So they'd be turning it and adding their coil. And then it's thought they were a bit like, oh, we could do this on like a spinny bit of rock. Um, and that's kind of how the early potter's wheels were very like that, they were very basic, they were just kind of something spinning. Um, if anyone's ever used the whirler at the coach house, it would be that sort of thing. A little turntable essentially. And then the fast wheel, which would be more akin to what we use today, obviously not with a motor, but perhaps powered by somebody's foot, um, would have been developed in the third millennium BC, which is also a very, very long time ago. And many people now think it was developed in ancient Sumeria and Mesopotamia, and which I recently learned is actually Iraq. And so that's, there you go, every day's a school day, but other folk think it might have been Egypt. Hi, so throwing on a wheel is a very popular way of making pottery, and it used to be the main means of manufacture. But things have moved on a bit now, and the main means of manufacture is now slip casting which is also something that we do at the coach house. If any of you ever been in the, in the kiln shed, we've got wall to wall moulds. So slip casting, as you see here, is you've got a mould, stage one. Number two, pour slip into the mould, which is what is happening in this picture. Now, what is slip? Slip is liquid clay. So slip is where you've gotten your clay and you've mushed it up with water and you've made it into a really fine consistency, a bit like double cream, is how I would describe it and you assemble your mould, pour your liquid clay into it, leave it for maybe about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on how thick you want your vase to be, or your whatever you're casting, and the mould is made of plaster, and the plaster absorbs water. So where the clay is touching the walls of the mould, the plaster is sucking the water out and it's kind of hardening the clay around there. So you essentially get like a clay skin forming inside, which is what is shown in this last bit of the diagram here. Um, so you've got that kind of hardened clay skin forming around. Now you then tip it upright, tip all the liquid clay out the bottom, uh, drain it out, then leave it to dry for maybe another 10, 15 minutes. And then you can open up your moulds and you can take out whatever you've cast, like we've got in this picture here. So that's a, so people can do this now on an industrial scale, and it's quite often how um, big ceramics factories work. So a lot of the stuff that you've got in your house will have been made using this slip casting. Um, yeah, I find it quite difficult because you've got to be quite precise, uh, but it's, um, it's a really good way, especially if you can make your own moulds, it can be very fun. And then lastly, we're going to look at 3D printing. So there we go. So if you look at this GIF, the little piping robot is piping out layers of clay and building up this object. Um, so it's basically a modern jazzed up version of coiling. So that first technique we looked at, coiling, except it's done by a robot, essentially using a piping bag. So if you've ever decorated a cake using a piping bag, it's a fancy robotic camping piping bag filled with clay. So it is less futuristic than you might expect. Ah, so here's uh, what generally most 3D printed vessels look like. Um, it's still really being developed for clay. There's quite a few different kind of technical issues with it. Um, clay, 
as a material doesn't really lend itself to 3D printing. A lot of like plastics and things are actually much easier to work with because the issue you have with clay is you need to give it time to dry um, and the timing is very important. So I have a friend who works at a, as a ceramics technician at a university with a 3D printer and when they're doing their 3D printing quite often they're having to sit and dry it with a hair dryer um, so it's, it's not quite as glamorous and futuristic. If you also get problems with air bubbles stuck in your piping bag so it'll kind of go halfway through and then your pot isn't quite as seamless as before um, and also just things collapse or you get little cracks or air bubbles and you can't fire stuff so it's quite a it's not people need to keep experimenting to kind of get really nice stuff made out of it because you also need to go and smooth out all these lines as well so this one um, would have been made upside down with the kind of these loops coming out so here's an artist who's um, doing kind of slightly more interesting things uh, with 3D printing. So she's kind of able to do these kind of negative shapes. So she'll have designed these on a computer and then programmed them into the printer. And her name is Kate Blacklock. So there we go. There's another two of her pieces. Um, yeah, so they're, they're quite, quite complicated. Um, and then also we've got this guy, Andre, Andrea, Andre. Salvatore, um, and this is one of his pieces here. Um, so these would be purely decorative because you can see there's a bit of a few cracks in there, which is one of the issues with 3D printing. And um, so it wouldn't actually be able to hold water, but it's a beautiful sculpture. Um, and he does it by kind of placing these clay balls into the vats as the printer is printing. So it kind of the printer has to react to these objects that he's putting in. Um, so that's kind of the, the kind of maybe the next step in um, 3D in ceramics, but we'll see. Um, it's not necessarily that that exciting. So now we're going to have a talk about firing. So that's the last stage. So once you've made your piece, you then let it dry, and then once it's completely bone dry and quite hard and delicate, you will put it in a kiln for its first firing, where you fire it up to generally about ten. 1050, so 1050 degrees generally. That's called a biscuit firing or a first firing. And then after that, you would fire it another time, and that is when you would add your glaze or any decoration. So your glaze is um, essentially a thin layer of liquid glass that you paint onto the outside of your vase, and then you fire it again, and the heat of the kiln heats up the glass particles and they all melt and form a beautiful glaze on the top. So here we've got two pictures of kilns. On the right we have an electric kiln, which is what I use in my work and it's also what we use at the coach house. And then on the left we have a wood firing kiln, which is probably, which I mean it is, it is the earliest um, form of firing. So you would, um, our ancient ancestors would have made, kind of done firing in pits with fire. They dug a big hole, lit a fire, put all their put all their pots in, um, and then we've kind of scaled up to being able to build these kind of um, wood burning structures, um, which can create really cool effects. And then we've also got um, gas firing, so that's where you have a, a kind of a modern kiln, but it burns using gas, so you get these flames in the sides there. Um, and all these different types of firing um, allow you to use different glazes and do different things. They cause different effects, um, which again, we could go into, but we would be here for hours, hours and hours and hours. And then this is um, kind of the main type of kiln that was used in the British ceramics industry. So if you go to Stoke-on-Trent, which is kind of one of the big ceramics producing towns, you'll see loads of these, and these are called bottle kilns. So this whole building, is a kiln and people would go in and stack them all and then you light a really big fire and burn it for a long time um, until you get to a certain heat and master potters can kind of look at the colour of a flame and they can tell what temperature it's at which is pretty pretty impressive. So now we're gonna go on and we're look at, gonna look at my favourite pots from around the world. So we're gonna start with this, Woo! very creepy kind of earthy colours, we've got some kind of different fish and stones and a big big old snake in there. 
So this is policy wear. So here's one, uh, it was a platter with lobsters on it. They probably would have been used to serve seafood. So that's quite nice. You kind of got these 3D ceramic elements in amongst your food. And policy wear was started by Bernard Passily. Palissy, I spelled it wrong, in France in the 16th century, so quite a long time ago, but it was revived in the 19th century, so in the kind of 1800s, and that's when it got really popular and was imitated across Europe. So it's made from earthenware, which is one of these low fire clays, um, and it's coloured using a lead glaze. So lead glaze is generally white, and then you use oxides to add colour. So oxides are different minerals that you would then paint on top of your glaze. So you'd dunk it in this clear, 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 not clear, you'd dunk it in your lead glaze, it all dries in, powder coating, and then you would paint on your colours. Um, yeah, also lead, not so super great for tableware. We don't do that anymore because it's bad for you. Um, an interesting fact about Palisade is he would cast the creatures used in his um, sculptures from life because um, he was a famous, he was really into studying nature, quite into biology and um, so he, you, he would cast um, all these snakes and lizards and things from life. Obviously they would be dead but um, you know what I mean. So here's another one there. So some of these were decorative and some of these were for serving food so I imagine this one would have been decorative and I just really like all the snakes in here and also just the high shine. I think the high shine on these is really beautiful. And apparently one time he, he was so um, keen on continuing to try his tests with ceramics, but he was out of fuel. He chopped up all the furniture in, in his house and used it to fire his kiln. And so here's a kind of an artist's interpretation of that. There he is, super committed to his craft, there's his family in the back, just like, oh, what are you doing? We really need that. So this is one of my favourite pieces. I really love this one. Um, I just think the composition of it is great with this lovely kind of swirly snake in the middle and then all the kind of flowers and other creatures around the edges. I think it's really great. Um, he's used a lot of a kind of a lovely blue in there, which I really like. Um, yeah, I just think the colour scheme's great and I, I really like it. So I popped this picture in here. This um, isn't a great example um, of a policy wear, but I think it's just really good to show how 3D some of them were. So they weren't just kind of like low reliefs on a plate. Some of them were really, really sculptural and very large. And you can see here they've used a similar technique to one of the things that we do at the coach house, where they use a, a kind of a garlic crusher to get these sausages of clay. Yeah, so I think they're quite gruesome, but quite gorgeous. So you can imagine them somebody bringing you out your dinner on something like this, you'd be a bit like, what are you up to? Whoop. So the next um, type of ceramics we're going to look at here is called Arbol de la Vida. And it is from Mexico. And Arbol de la Vida means tree of life. And so I really like this one we've got on the left here with kind of, I think it's Adam and Eve at the bottom. Um, and then all the way up the tree, They've got a band. There's loads of people playing lots of different brass instruments there, and beautiful flowers and leaves. And then on this one on the right, it looks like we've got the baby Jesus in the middle and then lots of other folk all around. And they're kind of in traditional Mexican garb. And you've got these lovely little angels here, which I really like. I think these little faces with wings are really nice. They're like human butterflies. So the kind of the tradition of tree of life um, ceramics generally depict the biblical story of Adam and Eve and these started to be made in Mexico after the Spanish conquest so that's when you know Spaniards arrived and they were like right this is ours um, and kind of the friars that they brought over destroyed um, many old religious articles including ceramics that showed kind of the old gods and they were kind of they commissioned lots of people to make new objects and new pictures and new new things to depict saints and other Christian iconography. So it's a bit of soft power there, you know, they're getting out their agenda and their religion through art and they're kind of using these visual images to engage with the indigenous people 
and being like, you don't want your gods anymore, you want these guys, they're really great. Um, probably using a bit more violence in that as well. But um, yeah, so they were a kind of a visual way to evangelise about biblical stories to the native population. And kind of from that point on, um, the ceramics kind of became a fusion of Spanish and indigenous techniques. Um, so you, can, you wouldn't look at these and think they look Spanish, you think they look uniquely South American. Um, so they've kind of like, like taken it and fused those two things together. I just think they're really nice. So here's another two that are a bit, bit more secular. Um, so I think this is a really fun one with this donkey, with this kind of, so a lot of these are candelabras. I should also point that out, sorry, these be divots at the top are for candles. Um, so you've got one with this lovely donkey with some birds and then also this gorgeous bird bath one with little hanging bits as well. I just think these are really lovely. And um, kind of the people that still make these can make really huge ones. So they can make smaller ones, maybe with a different theme for a different Easter, ho different holiday. So you kind of get Easter ones, you get Lent ones, you get Christmas ones, you get kind of Day of the Dead ones, Cinco de Mayo ones, different ones for different themes. And some of the largest ones can take up to three years to make. Um, so they can get pretty ornate. And I just, I just think they're really nice handmade sculptures. Um, and in the video I'm going to send out, there's a video of a few people making these. I just think they're really cool. So now we're kind of moving over to Africa. We're going to look at the ceramics um, of the Mambilla people who are from West Cameroon and Eastern Nigeria. Um, and I just really love the texture of this vase. So it's likely that this vase was used making, um, using the coiling technique and then they've added on um, this fantastic raised design and quite often a lot of these are smoke fired so they're not really using glazes and they use the smoke from the firing process to colour um, these pieces. So what we're going to be looking at today are TADEP um, and these are figgle bit figure festivals vessels and unfortunately I couldn't find up out most about these because one a lot of them have been all the older ones have been taken by different museums around the world, but they didn't bother to learn much about them. Um, so there isn't too much information there. And then also a lot of these pictures I took from like kind of art dealing websites and they're like specific African art websites that don't really have much information on them, but sell lots of things for lots of money. And um, so that's a bit dodgy. So thought that these are an abode for ancestral spirits and um, nobody seems to have bothered to go and ask anyone what they're used for um, and traditionally they'd be made of wood so these kind of ceramic pieces are a lot rarer. I just think they're really they're just so they've got so much character to them. I especially love this guy and um, I really think that's what I'm like on a Monday morning I'm like oh no I can't do it um, and you can see here some of the smoke from the smoke firing here um, which I think has coloured them really nicely. Then also this guy, he looks really worried. I think he's really great. So they're kind of, they're they're kind of vases, but they're also they're also sculptures, you know. And then here's another two which I absolutely love. So I think this one's here. This is quite unusual in that it's got some paint put on it afterwards, and also this one. And I think this one's for, particularly fabulous because this is a spout. So when you pour it, it would um, be pouring out his mouth. Um, Yes, yeah, so I just really love the way these are built and I love the, the way the paint is applied. I think they almost look like they're made of bronze. Um, I just think they're really gorgeous. Um, I wish there was a bit more information out there about these. Um, so if anybody has any, please let me know. That'd be great. Then we're moving over to Japan, to the Jomon period. Um, and the Jomon period began roughly 16,500 years ago which is the late Stone Age, and lasted 14,000 years. So ages and ages, long before the Egyptians is what I've got here. Um, so these were pottery vessels crafted in ancient Japan, and they are generally accepted to be the oldest pottery in Japan and among the oldest in the world. Um, so the majority of this type of pottery has rounded bottoms, and they're usually quite small, um, and it's thought that they were typically used to boil food or to fit in a fire. So they've got quite a practical use. So the picture we've got here is from the later Jomon period. And so it's one of the kind of 
closer to us in time. Um, and it's when, now is when things are getting a lot more elaborate. People are gotten a lot more au fait with pottery and they're you know pushing the boundaries and they're trying fancier and fancier stuff, as you can see here with this fabulous rim. So the name Jomon itself means rope patterned. So again, we're kind of thinking about that coil technique. We're building up using ropes of clay, but they would also use ropes to press into the surface of their pottery to create these patterns. And they were probably heated about 600 to 900 degrees. So they're not super high fire. They'd still be absorbing quite a lot of water at this stage. Um, and then here's another example. So a lot of them look quite similar, but I just love how swirly they are. I think they're really, really gorgeous. Um, yeah, and it looks like quite a, a thick clay, quite heavily grogged. So grogged means when there's lots of bits of kind of chunks of hardened clay in it, and that makes it stronger, a bit like terracotta. And then here are also some pieces from the Jomon period, and these are called dogu. Um, and they're small figurines found all over Japan, apart from Okinawa, the furthest south island um, from this period. And um, they're not entirely sure what they are, or what they were meant to be. So some people think they were a talisman for good health and safe childbirth. And they think that because of the kind of big round hips and a lot of them are quite big, big bellies. Um, and some people, they were also kind of think they're kind of fertility idols. Um, so perhaps they represent goddesses and um, to whom people prayed for food and health um, and they're often found in bits in middens so that's kind of you know when you dig up an archaeological site you essentially find their bin and, and they're quite often found broken in there so it's some people think that perhaps you would make a wish with these and then break them when your wish came true um, and now there's some other kind of wacky theories out there that perhaps these um, represent aliens that came to visit people at this time um, and this is thought because of their eyes, uh, because they look a bit like modern astronauts. I mean, I, I don't entirely get that vibe, but a lot of people think that um, these are perhaps visitors, representations of visitors from outer space. Um, and also because quite similar figures are found in South America at this time, um, which, you know, no one can really explain why that coinka dink happened. But there's loads of these all over. And I just think they're really cool. I love their like swirly patterns. I love their funny faces. I just think they're, they're really cool. And now we're going to look at this lady who I think is super cool. And her name is Betty Woodspin. So here she is kind of in one of her exhibitions, uh, which is quite different to anything that we've really looked at yet. So let's, let's dive on in. So Betty Wood, Woodman, I've written her name wrong. Betty Woodman, and was born in 1930 and died sadly in 2017. And she was a hugely successful American ceramicist and painter. And she worked between New York and Italy. And she used clay in both a two dimensional and a three dimensional way, creating these kind of brightly colored, vibrant, quite dreamy installations, as well as sculptures that went into these installations. So when she makes stuff, she really takes over the space and kind of uses the walls, uses the floor, sculpts things, you know, it's really all encompassing. And a lot of her um, ceramic sculpture is inspired by functional ceramics. So by functional ceramics, we mean vases, pots, jugs, cups, things that you can use and have a function. And so she quite often makes sculptures of these functional pieces, which is a bit confusing. So it looks like a functional thing or references the shape of a functional thing, but it doesn't actually work. And also historical ceramics. So a lot of it's kind of looking at the kind of ancient ceramics that we've just looked at um, and also kind of making references to kind of archeological remains. So bits of broken ceramics, bits of broken architecture. Um, yeah, so she's, she's very into the history of ceramics in both its kind of domestic form, so the things that we use every day, but also in the kind of historical context and the role it's had in human history. And um, so she says, the centrality of the vase in my work certainly implies a global perspective on art history and production. The container is a symbol. A symbol. It holds and pours all fluids, stores food and contains everything from flowers to our final remains. 
um, were just arty words for, wow, vases and things made of pottery are really important throughout human history. Woo! So let's have a, a bash in and look at some of her pieces. Um, so we're going to look at some of her paintings first. And um, her paintings are quite interesting because one, they're really vibrant and um, gestural, you know, where uh, just kind of, you can see how she's made the mark, there's a lot of energy into it. But also that she uses clay and ceramic decorating materials in her paintings. So in this, she's used Indian ink, um, which is the black stuff, um, acrylic paint, which is the coloured stuff, um, and also daubs of clay. So in here you've got these kind of peachy bits, that's daubs of clay. So it's got a kind of a, of a 3D and quite material element to her pieces. And um, she quite often uses wax, um, terra scigliata, which is kind of a coloured clay, and um, which has got different, it's mixed with vinegar. It's got um, quite different properties. Um, and she quite often uses kind of pottery tools to draw on pottery brushes. And um, so it's kind of, there's a real dialogue between her paintings and her drawings and also her ceramic work. You know, she's using the same tool, she's working in the same space. So here's another two of her pieces. My favourite one here is on that left. It's called Minoan Cup from 2015. And here you can really see the see this white lines with the kind of dots on it. That's using um, a wax resist, which is a very common technique used in ceramics where you put wax on your first, your second, your, your pottery after it's first firing. So it's hard, but it's not decorated yet. But when you put that wax on, it will resist any glaze or colouring that you're going to add. And I just, I just love the gesture of it. I think it's a really beautiful, simple picture. And I love the kind of the texture of the brush stroke in here. It's almost like there's soap in the paint. I think it's really nice. And then also this painting here um, from Nina's Room from 2016. And again, I just love the colour. I love the layout. It's kind of got these kind of vase forms in it. And I, I just really like it. I can't really tell you much beyond that. But I think it's, I think it's lovely. So moving on, here are some of kind of her installation paintings, if you say, if you want to say it that way. So she's kind of, she's kept her painting in the background. So she's still kind of using those resist techniques, but she's incorporated a sculptural object in there that is made of clay. So she's kind of got these two sheets of clay um, that make up the image of a vase. Um, and that's on this painting, which is also a shelf. So there's quite a lot of sculptural things happening within this painting, if that makes sense. She's kind of combining those two, those two forms and I just really like it. Um, and here's another one as well where she's kind of got ceramic elements of these flowers kind of pasted above. I just, I think they're really nice. Um, a lot of people say she was inspired by Matisse's cutouts, which are some of his later work where he kind of drew with a big pencil on these big bits of coloured paper and cut them out and it's very loose and very organic and full of energy. Um, so here um, are some kind of her sculptural vases here and these are called kimono ladies from 2015. So she's kind of, she's got these kind of slab built cylinders here. So she's made these cylinders using slabs of clay and then she's added on these kind of cut out gestural elements on the side onto which she has painted these women in kimonos doing this lovely dance and I just love how much motion there is in these pieces. There's kind of energy, you can kind of imagine these people kind of like twirling before you in these beautiful luxurious dresses. I think, I just think they're really cool, really nice. And then here's another um, piece from this series which is more um, abstract. So you've kind of got the abstract sense of the dancers here. You've just got the swirling pattern. You haven't necessarily got faces or arms, but it's kind of an abstract sculptural representation of people moving um, within these beautiful, beautiful robes. I, just, I love the drip of the glazes in here. This is where I get really ceramic nerdy and I'm just like, oh, how would you actually create that effect? Because although it might look quite haphazard, it you need to know a lot about chemistry to be able to create these effects, if that makes sense. And then here's another one of her installations called House of the South. And this one really represents, kind of references Matisse's cut out here. So you've got these lovely ceramic panels 
attached to the wall. And I think it kind of looks quite Greek. I think maybe it's the shapes and the kind of swirls, um, but it's kind of using these really bright colours. And I think this is where you kind of feel she's referencing kind of architecture as well. So although you're kind of using these domestic shapes of vases, and they're done in quite a kind of a flippant, um, energetic way, they're not too refined. It also kind of looks like she's constructing something, um, which I, I really like. Yeah, I've not really got much to say about these apart from that, I really, really like them. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about um, Emily Mullen, who I feel is an artist that's kind of um, working in a similar vein. You, cause she always presents her vases on a, on a kind of a painted shelf. Um, and she actually had an exhibition in Mount Florida Studios in the south side of Glasgow two years ago. Um, and she's an American artist. I don't know how they managed to get her to come over and have an exhibition in Mount Florida. Um, but it was really, really great. I absolutely loved it. And I recommend checking out um, anything that's on at Mount Florida Studios after lockdown because um, they do really cool stuff. So here's kind of the two sculptural vases. So she uses quite, again, quite a dark clay with just one white glaze over the top and always presents them with these kind of sculptural flowers and shelves. Um, yeah, so the one, this, this middle image is the, is the expression that I saw when she's kind of made all the shelves to match the vases, which I thought was really cool. I absolutely loved it. Um, and then I just, I love these kind of, these pieces with the big spider arms. And they're just really, they're not precise in any way. They're very, they feel like they're growing. They feel like they're kind of, they're creatures. Hi, right, so I recommend looking into her work. There's a lot of her stuff on Instagram, if you are on the gram. Um, and I think, I think it's lovely. It was one of those exhibitions where I went in and I was like, oh, I wish this was my work. This is really cool. And yeah, so check her out. She's, she's cool. There we go. And that is the end of our talk. Um, thanks for bearing with me. It was a... Uh, really hard to make decisions um, about what to include in this because I love ceramics. I'm absolutely obsessed. Um, so maybe we can do Eleanor's Top Picks Part 2 um, if you've enjoyed this and you haven't been too bored. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching, everyone. Hope you're well. Stay safe and see you soon.